So today is also a youth day, which means you get a holiday tomorrow. Um, and uh, it always coincides like that. And so last week we wanted to take the opportunity, because we never get the opportunity to, to reflect on the next generation, um, our children and um, grandchildren, the next generation that are coming up. And, and so uh, we took uh, time last week just to really just be reminded of our, the importance of, of just nurturing and encouraging the next generation. And of course, on Father's Day, as we do on Mother's Day every year, we want to encourage our men. We want to challenge our men, men in general, um, fathers in particular. But um, we don't want anybody to feel left out. And uh, so we try and, and work it where we can encourage each other in, in a, with a kingdom perspective on these matters. Because uh, the role of a man and the role of a woman in society these days is being completely decimated reinterpreted and, and so on. And now men can become women and women can become men. And apparently men can fall pregnant. And, uh, you know, so what is a man? And, and the, the man that God created. And even despite the fall, what, is, what does a biblical man, a Christian man, look like? It's really important for us to, to grapple with this. And you ladies also need to hear this too so you understand your men. Uh, it's just helpful that way. So, so we're, going to, we're going to have a look... Um, this morning, it's not going to be your normal kind of preach through a passage and so on. I do obviously want to reference the, the scriptures, just, but, but just for our encouragement this morning. One of the best things that um, Kim and I discovered when, uh, when we were first married, and uh, this is before we had DSTV, before there was Netflix or anything like that, there was just SABC and ETV. And one of the things we would watch from time to time would be the Oprah show. And on the Oprah show, uh, there was a whole lot of rubbish, but occasionally she would um, interview a very interesting guest. And one of those interesting guests was a man by the name of Dr. John Gray. You might not know the name, but you probably know the book that he wrote, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And I'll tell you what, Kim and I are very glad that we, went, we got the book and we read the book, and it helped us immensely understanding the differences between men and women. You know, I, just, we, I think it was the first year we got married. Now, I'd married this wonderful creature, uh, and, but I needed to learn how to relate to her. And she had married this great guy, and she needed, to, she needed to learn how to relate to him. I'm telling you what, it really, really helped us. And um, more, more recently, uh, just over a decade ago, as Laugh Your Way to Better Marriage, many of you have um, uh, listened to that and, and, and seen that. But understanding the uniqueness of God's calling upon a man and the way that God has shaped a man, and how God has shaped a woman for that matter, I think is critical to our Working together in the church, understanding who we are in Christ, understanding our purpose in the home and, and in society. So, gentlemen, we're going to have a look at ourselves this morning, uh, just, uh, just to be encouraged, to be challenged. We're going to look at three aspects of masculinity, and, and there, there are probably many others, but I uh, just want to focus on, um, on three this morning. And, and the first is how man is emotionally. All the ladies are going, yeah, 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 help us understand this. All right. I will. Um, men don't do emotions very well. We don't. Eh? We just don't. It's not to say that men are unemotional. It's just that, that guys aren't wired in the same way ladies are when it comes to expressing feelings. We just don't. Um, and and um, um, biologists and, and neurobiologists will tell you that it's the, the communication aspects of the brain and the emotive aspects of the brain are very differently wired in women as they are in men, generally speaking, obviously. Uh, and so men, men being more cognitive, men being kind of thinkers and, and so on and so on, don't easily process or express our emotions. Now, I know, ladies, that's hard for you because you want to know how we feel about stuff. I get it. It's not that we are unwilling. It's not that we're difficult or trying to be difficult. It's just... A lot of, like, emotion doesn't come easy to a guy, certainly not expressing that, okay? What we do is we think. We go quiet. We do. We just do. And when we're quiet, we're not necessarily mad at you, ladies. Just so that you know that. We might be, but we're not always, okay? <laughs> so when you come home from work, ladies, and, you, and you're shouting for your husband, and you find him in the back garden, and he's literally staring out into the beautiful sunset evening, and you say, what are you thinking? And he says, Nothing. He's not lying. He's, he's, he's really not lying. He might be lying. I mean, there might be something on his mind. But chances are, he's actually just, yeah, guys can do that. If a lady says that, you know she's lying. Because me, ladies are never, 
Never not think about something. But, but, but men can. Men can, particularly when we stress. In fact, you see the differences so clearly when, when you stress. So under stress, you had a rough day and bad day and stuff's going, ladies like to talk. They want to come and talk, and you get carboshed in the kitchen. You've just walked in from home, uh, from work. You just got home. It's a terrible day. You know, and I, um, guys don't. We don't want to talk. Ladies need to understand this, please. We don't want to talk. And it's not you. It's really not you. It's just us. You know why? Because guys think. And you know how we process our problems? Thinking alone. And the key word is alone, not thinking. It's important, but the more important is alone. In our cave. So, the best thing you can do, ladies, is just to help you, is just let your guy go and figure it out. He will. He'll go and figure it out. Just give him that space. Just give him that space. And so, so for us men, it's not always easy for us to express our emotions, but we also, at the same time, need to learn to do that. Because men do have emotions, and we do have feelings, and we do live in a world where we get hurt, and we respond, and, 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 and stuff like that. Yes, something we also heard on the Oprah show by some other guy, because that's all we watched, okay? Okay. Uh, some other uh, guru who had studied masculinity and so on, and he said this, I've never forgotten this. He said, the only socially acceptable emotion a man can show is anger. You think about that. The only acceptable emotion a man in society that a man can show is anger. So when you see a guy like, when you watch the rugby yesterday, bulls have a home final, eh? Uh, when, uh, when you see the Springboks smashing up the All Blacks, yes, that Christian, it's good. Um, man's in control, man's powerful when he's aggressive. When a man expresses sadness or remorse, you know, it's a bit soft, eh? Just like he's not really a tough guy. Um, when a man uh, shares anxiety or fear, then it's a bit of a wuss. You don't like wussies. It's true. And I'm not saying society has put that, that kind of construct. And so, the only acceptable emotion, a man, in fact, if a man shares too much um, excitement, well, you've got to be suspicious of that. Um, but the only thing that a man can accept, uh, that a man can express, and it's socially acceptable, nobody goes, is, is anger. And they're really cross and, and so on. And I'm not talking about inappropriate anger, you know, violence and, and, um, and so on. And so and here's the thing, here's, here's the toxic thing for a lot of guys is that we do have emotions, and we're not always sure how to express them and, and get them out there, and so we can bottle it up there nonetheless. We all carry stress, and we get hurt, and, and we bleed just like everybody else. And then what happens often is it explodes, and there's aggression. And, and often that aggression is shown in unacceptable ways. It's expressed in unacceptable ways, from passive-aggressive right through to, um, to physical aggression that's inappropriate. It's so interesting how Jesus manage this. It's so interesting how, how Jesus had the full range of emotions. Jesus wept. He had compassion. He was moved and stirred by, by people that were sick, and, and um, he laughed. He had the full range of emotion. He had the full range of emotion. And so we learn from, from Jesus, the man, gentlemen, and we learn how to process. Remember um, with Peter, in John chapter 21, the disciples, Jesus has been resurrected, but they they're not sure. They're in this interphase now between that and Acts, you know, 2 and when Pentecost happened. They're not sure. In fact, they've got Peter and John and the, the other fishermen. They've gone back fishing. The other disciples are hanging around. And Jesus finds them on the Lake of Galilee. And, and he makes a little breakfast for them. And remember what he asks Peter, do you love me more than me? Do you love me? It's an awkward question when guys ask another guy, do you love me? Um, and I know, I know the, the, the thing was, you know, Jesus asked him three times, canceling out the three denials. I know that's what it meant. Um, and that's, that's, but at another level, what was Jesus doing? He was bringing Peter in touch with how he felt. Because he, he then had to verbalize it to say, I love you. Yes, Lord. I love you. I love you. It's a good thing for us as men to practice and to learn and on the aggression side, and, and as men, we all carry that. We do. Um, we, we live in a, a cutthroat world. Men, men are taking hits every day. They're taking hits at work. They're taking hits in, in the world in which they live. Sometimes they're taking hits in family. Um, they're taking hits everywhere. And we process that in the best way that we can. But here's what I want to say to us as men. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The last one is 
In Galatians chapter 5, 22, self-control. You see, if we try in, in our own strength to do it more and more and more, we're going to fail. But if the Holy Spirit, if we are being saturated by the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit comes to renew us, and the Holy Spirit comes to touch our hearts, to bring us to peace, to bring us to peace. And so what we need is more of Jesus. What we need is more of the Holy Spirit, just to be shaping our hearts, men. Even those inner parts, in those inner parts that's sometimes wounded and hurt. Because if we don't, it's going to come out somewhere and normally hurt those around us. And so, and so emotionally, as much as, as men, we, we can struggle and we can challenge, and it's a challenge for us, we also want to bring it to the Lord so that He can restore us and you know, even as men, it doesn't take away from our masculinity at all. It just brings us to wholeness and peace. You know, Andrew shared of his dad, he was at peace because inside he'd been made whole through Jesus Christ. And we constantly go back to that. Just before we leave this point, just want to say this um, to, to husbands, gentlemen, your wives need to hear, I love you a lot. Just do it. Don't say, don't be like that, you know, I, I told her I loved her on a wedding day, and I, if, it, if it changes, I'll let her know. It's such a stupid joke, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Tell her I love her often, as often as you can. And to your children, tell them that you're proud of them, as often as you can. Remember what happened when Jesus was baptized? He came out the water, and uh, he heard the Father say, you are my son whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. Put in colloquial language, you're my son, I love you, I'm proud of you. From the father to the son. Our kids need to hear that. And uh, hey guys, we can practice that. Practice in the mirror if you have to, but, uh, but you, can, you can do it. You can do it. Because those, those who love us and look up to us as husbands, as fathers, they need to hear that from us. Backed up with action. Uh, right, number two. So the first thing we are going to look at is... Um, is uh, a man and his emotions. The second thing we're going to look at is a man and his sexuality. Masculinity and sexuality. It's very hard to um, sort of divorce the two. Um, but that, that part of us, that part of us that God has made as masculine, and God made male and female, and he made them for each other. For each other. So we grow up until about 12, 13 years of age where girls are like, ew, ew, ew. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, you know, puberty is a weird thing. Then your eyes are opened. They really are. Your eyes are open to this beautiful form that you've met at youth or school or wherever. You know, in junior school, oh, I didn't want to hang around with it. Now in high school, everything changes. Um, why? What's kicking in? What's kicking in is that, that masculine drive to ultimately, out of that attraction to the opposite sex, to find a mate. To find a mate. I mean, it sounds very carnal, doesn't it? Um, but, it but it's exactly that. And for women, it's exactly the same. All of a sudden, those boys, those dirty, gross boys, well, I wouldn't mind if he asked me to the dance. Uh, you know, and what is happening? There's this, then, this attraction for, for the other. That is, that is God-given because God made it and, and so on. And so we move towards each other. Uh, and, and we see it even in the Bible. I mean, it was different in those days because, you, had, you know, you, Abraham sent his servant to go and find a wife for his son Isaac. I think it's a bit of a cop-out, but I mean... How would he know what Isaac really liked? I don't know. It seemed a bit risky. Jacob. Jacob. Kudos, men. Jacob. Seven years he worked for a potential father-in-law. Seven years he labored to get the ugly older sister that he didn't want. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but that's how it is. I mean, so, no, 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 he didn't walk away. He married her. Didn't walk away. He then worked for another seven years to get the hot young sister that he really wanted. <laughs> hey? See, there's something in a man that's going to pursue. He's going to work hard to get the lady that he wants. And you know that God has designed it that way. God has designed it that way. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, we, built, we built with this in, in our hearts as, as men. And sadly, the world has come, particularly our modern world, um, the ancient world too, but... but for, for reference in our modern world, and it's just taken this beautiful thing, and it has just twisted the whole thing, just messed it all up. And it's like there have been 
when I was, I, was, I was thinking back just in my lifetime, um, and just some of the, it feels like shocks that have just hit our society. You know, Playboy maybe being one of the first shocks. I'm talking from a moral purity, you know, as God created to be. All of a sudden, Hugh Hefner comes along with his Playboy magazine that came into, became a mansion and all the rest, which was nothing more than a glorified brothel. Um, and and it, it, made, it made like the, the masculine, you know, you, you needed to, you know, to, to be like the, the real man. You need to have women all over all the time, having sex with whoever you wanted. And that just messed up everything, didn't it, in society? I'm not blaming you, you're there alone. Um, but, you know, what it, what it did was it kind of legitimized this, this, like, this, this male lover who could just, the stud who could just, you know, have his way with as many women as possible. It looked, um, looked more the man for it. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, we, we've seen pornography. Now, pornography's been around a long, long time, but the insidious thing about the technological age in which we live was the internet first, but more so the smartphone. Because that means every single person in the palm of their hand has access to anything, to anything. Try and control it, it's very difficult to control it. It really is. Um, and, and, so, and so in everybody's hand, every single person, it's right there. The temptation, the lust of the eye, the lust of the eye. Um, and, and really it is. It's fueled lust. That is a bigger deal for men than it is for women, generally speaking. Mostly because men are, are visually wired. And, and so pornography has given this, this, this thing for, for men to feed on. And two interesting, two interesting things. And pornography is so damaging. And yet it's so real. Um, and, and such a struggle. Um, for so many men. It doesn't mean that a man that you might know or love because he watches porn is, is a pervert. It means he's struggling with a lust issue. It's often, actually, a struggling with an intimacy issue in his own personal thing. Um, and, and, uh, and, and it affects. So studies have shown, studies have shown that, and, uh, and these would be two, uh, I share this with you so that so you can understand almost as a, as a check to go, uh, I really don't want that if I'm going to go down this road. Um, studies have shown that, um, that with, with ongoing watching pornography, because of what you're feeding yourself on a screen is not real, um, you know, as in for you, it's fantasy, for you. I mean, they're doing it for real, on, you know, but, but for you, it's a, it's a fantasy. It makes intimacy with your partner, whether it's your wife or a future partner, more and more difficult because you feed in the fantasy that is hollow and empty and not the real thing. Not the real thing. The second interesting study is that um, I know um, erectile dysfunction is, you heard it in church, is a, <laughs> is a complex issue. It's a complex issue. But, but there, are, there are studies that, that work on a correlation between watching porn and erectile dysfunction. Now, I don't know, men. That'll put me off just right there. I don't know. Just, no. <laughs> no, we don't want that. We don't want to be struggling with intimacy issues. And so, and so um, I'm just giving this information to help you. So that, so that you can go, no! I, that's, the real, that's the reality of it. You know why? Because what the devil sells us, what the devil sells us always comes with a price and a cost. It just does. Uh, Ashley Madison, if you don't know what that is, good. It's a website started in 2002 for married couples that wanted to have affairs. Their tagline was, life is short, have an affair. Spice up your marriage a bit. Spice up your marriage. And then, of course, they got hacked in 2015. <laughs> None of you were on, eh? You shouldn't be. Uh, 60 million users. Married people. It's for married people only. I don't know how you check. And, but anyway, uh, married people only. But it's not that. It's the tagline. Life is short. Have an affair. It's not so bad. Adultery can spice up your life. No, it can't. It'll destroy your life because it's sin. But anyway, this is, these are the shock waves that hit us as a society, as a society. Fifty Shades of Grey. <coughs> um, when the novel came out, they were amazed at, at um, um, how, how quickly it flew off the shelves. These are before the movies, which none of you saw, of course. Um, flew off the shelf. And they asked, they asked people, they asked women, what, what about it 
because mostly women bought it. Um, what about Fifty Shades? <laughs> Made you want to buy it. You know what they found? This was so interesting. It said they felt liberated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How has being tied up and spanked been liberated? I don't like being tied up and spanked, ever. <laughs> Nobody should. But they were finding liberation. True, true story. I mean, survey. But these are the shockwaves that we're dealing with in our society that are fueling the lust that is messing up men and messing up society. How then do we respond? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, Paul writes to, to Timothy and he says this to, to the church. Do not rebuke an older man. We looked at that last week. But treat, verse 2, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, with absolute purity. Absolute purity. And you say, John, that's difficult. It is. But here's the thing, gentlemen, when you're struggling with lust, or any other sin for that matter, the blood of Jesus doesn't just forgive you. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. It cleanses us. It cleanses. It cleanses your mind. So, so you have the opportunity to pray the blood of Jesus over your mind, over every sinful thought, over your eyes, whatever, I know it sounds like a bit strange, but you do that, do that consistently and see what happens. Do that consistently, see what happens. And then Ephesians chapter 5, this is then if you're married if you're in a relationship, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25, the injunction to wives, you've heard us say this so many times, wives, you are to submit to your husbands, but husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love your wives, you put her first. Well, second, next to God. Um, you put her first, you treat her like a queen. Treat her like a queen to the best of your ability. You treat her with respect and honor. It's a treasured possession that God has given to you. So, so now if you're despairing, gentlemen, and, uh, and so on, be encouraged by this. For two years in a row, the sexiest man in Britain voted in was... Not you. <laughs> Was Jeremy Clarkson. All the ladies are, who's Jeremy Clarkson? Um, that show that your husband watched called Top Gear, now more recently Clarkson's Farm. Um, so, I find this fascinating. I go like, what the heck? I mean, we know Brits are strange, but really, I mean, we're not blind. Uh, what? So, so they examined, the Telegraph and the Guardian and all the rest, they went to find out why so many women voted two years in a row, one year's a fluke, two years, hey, this is like, why so many women voted Jeremy Clarkson as the sexiest man alive in Britain? Do you know what they found? Here's the bottom line. Is they found because he's, he's, uh, he's self-assured. He tunes the council. If you watch Clarkson's farm, you know, um, he'll stand up for what he's right. He does his own thing. He'll stick it to the establishment. But he'll cry when his little piggy has to go to the abattoir. This mix of confidence and compassion. This is the answer that they gave. There's hope for us all. Fake the tears. <laughs> no. No. Here's the thing. Do you know why? Because there's a truth in there. Try and forget about Jeremy Clarkson for a moment. There's a truth in there. Here's the truth. Confidence. Confidence in men and women. Not arrogance. Not cocky. Confidence. You know, it's assured of who you are. Confident in who you are as God has made you to be. Is one of the greatest turn-ons. It just is. Confidence. There you have it. If you're adding compassion, even better. But that confidence, that self-assuredness that you have in being your own person, like, dare I say, Jeremy Clarkson. But you can also have compassion. Compassion is quite an intoxicating combination. It really is. Interestingly, nothing to do with looks. I mean, obviously, but, uh, you know, <laughs> otherwise anybody could win. Uh, and that's a helpful thing for us. You know why, gentlemen? We can grow in Christ. We can grow in our confidence in Christ. 
that God has made us who he has made us to be. And as we grow in healing and as we grow um, in, in the person that God has called us to be, when Andrew shared about his dad, and I met his dad a few times as he came here, um, he was a quiet man, but he was a confident man. He walked, walked tall, but with a humility and a grace. That kind of confidence, the humility that comes from a God-filled life. Amen? All right. Last one. So we looked at um, a man, his emotions, sexually, and his sexuality, and then lastly, spiritually. Spiritually. And Spiritual is, a, is sometimes a challenging one for, for men. But here's what's quite interesting is, is and you can see this. Um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work this out. That even the way that we often express our spirituality, generally speaking, is, is sometimes different for men and women. Men tend to be doers. We like to get involved. And, and, and you know, um, women, obviously, sometimes more in that intuitive. intuitive. That's, why, that's why sometimes men battle with the intimate aspects of our relationship with God, but for women, it's like, well, why wouldn't it be that way? Um, and, and I was reading an interesting article that was uh, unpacking the, the fall. The fall of man is recorded in Genesis chapter 3, and in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, it's quite interesting. This is what it says. In fact, it says this to the woman. This is the, the curse that God placed on the woman as a result of sin, as a result of their sin. In uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbirth. Um, every mother says amen. Um, you get your back um, on Eve when you see her in heaven one day. Just stare at her. <laughs> I bore four children. In pain and agony. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, What's interesting is man was called to rule, but rule what? Yeah. It's called to rule the land. God said to Adam and Eve that everything I've given you, rule over. Look after this creation. Work the land, gentlemen. Work the land. Um, that was what man was given to rule. Not woman. But here's what happens when things get warped in the fall. As a result of sin, it says your desire will be for your husband. And there's an innate desire in so many women that feel like I'm incomplete if I don't find a man. And even if he treats me badly, I'll go back to that man. Because there's something, there's something there. Now, that's not to say God has cursed that. It's an outworking of the fall. So when we find our security in Christ, we find healing in that area, yes? But here's what's interesting. To the man, it says he will rule over you. We're never meant to rule over anybody else except the, the world in which we lived um, the, and, and the ground which man was to work, the crops that he was to plant or the cattle to keep, and now modern, in, in modern day terms, to the work that he does. Why, why rule? Because instinctively in men, a life that is not given to the Lord in humility will want to rule over something. We want to be the boss. In our fallen state, the pride... And the, the ego of man wants to be the boss. I want to have the final say. I want to win the argument. It's just how we are. That's why we need to surrender to the Lord. That's why we give that to the Lord so he can work in our lives. But here's, here's what was observed. The outworking of that is this. That because men in their fallen state want to rule over and try and control everything, we isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves. And... That even plays out spiritually. We isolate and we end up disconnected. Disconnected from, um, from those that we, that we love. Disconnected because we're trying to be in control. We're trying to hold it all together. And even that flows into, into spiritually. Um, we saw, you can see this on the mission field. You know, when, when men and women go on missions, if you look at the mission movement from the 1700s to the 1800s um, in world history, uh, men and women went across the world, mostly from Europe and America, across the world. Men, this is so interesting, men went to build Bible colleges, plant churches. Men went to go and establish mission stations. Women went to work and serve. So interesting. You go read stories like Amy Carmichael, Gladys Aylward, who went to China. Amy Carmichael went to India. More, more recently, Mother Teresa. What did she go? She went to go and establish a big ministry? No. She went to go and serve. She just went to go and serve. Those children discarded and left on the streets of Calcutta, India. And she gave her life to doing that. Because men live out their spirituality building stuff and, and doing stuff and, and so on. Women 
instinctively connect and build. That's not to say that there can't be women who lead and men who, who, who serve, but it, it does show sometimes the, the different leanings in terms of our nature and our makeup. Um, men often are drawn to roles of leading and responsibility and building and so on. It's not a surprise then that you find more women intercessors, more women prophets, more women in those intuitive kind of sensory um, sensing uh, of, of God moments. So, of course, we want men and women in both, but we should not be surprised that sometimes there are ministries and, and a- expressions of spirituality that actually are more geared for women. They, and, and we need both. We need both in the church for the church to be built up and the church to come to maturity. Uh, and, so, and so for us as men as well, we want to, we want to open our hearts to, to the intimate love of God because that ultimately changes us. It's difficult for some men. It really is. Um, and so it's in that way that we are able to respond and allow God to heal. And then as men, though, there's something in a man that is a kind of built-in warrior. That's why we like war movies and stuff like that, action stuff, because guys like that. We picture ourselves in there. You know, uh, that's why men play contact sport. And, and so, yes, God's put that in a man. They put that in a man to fight for something. You know what we can do spiritually? Fight for that which we believe in. Fight for that which we love. Fight for that which we love. That means fighting for our family, fighting for what is right, standing up for what is right, doing what is right. Because in terms of the culture out there, it is a war. We're going to, we're going to war for righteousness' sake. For ourselves, for our families, for the next generation, for the current generation. We're going to stand up for what is right. We're going to be men of principle. And we are going to pray. Last week I said, pray over your family. Pray over your family. Pray over your children, your grandchildren. Pray because you have authority, men. God has given you that authority. And I know sometimes family devotions, it's awkward and it's weird. Try this. Around grace, and last week I said, have a, have a meal time, probably supper time, where you all sit at the family, all sit as a family at the table. And before you um, tucker into the, to the food, just say grace together. I know many fathers do that, but you know, you can stretch that a little bit to just, is there a need? Can I pray for something? Pray for the kids' exams. And what you're doing is, you're, you're not adding anything else. You're not being strange or weird about family devotion time. You're just taking something that's probably happening in all your homes and saying, let's just stretch it a little bit just to pray. As head of the home, you do that. And, and do so because you are being an example and you are leading the fight for that which is right. Leading by example. Men are drawn to the armor of God. We get it. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. We're ready, ready to advance. We're ready to defend. Don't you hear a lot of women talk about the armor of God? Well, I don't know. Does it fit? I don't know if it's the right color. <laughs> these shoes, they're just so all these shoes of peace. How do my legs look? Does it make me look big? And with that, we end because we don't want to answer that. Uh, we put on the armor of God because we're in a fight. I want to say something just to fathers and then we're done. That mothers generally are nurturers. We know this. They're wired that way. Part of God's given responsibility and, and so on, to nurture and to love. So when we, as a child, you graze, your, you graze your knee, you run to mom, not dad. Dad's going to stop it. What did you do? Falling off your back. Here's what dads do. Fathers shape the identity of their children. That is a God-given responsibility to men. In the way that fathers affirm their sons as young men, in the way that the fathers affirm their daughters as young ladies, that you look pretty in that dress, and, and so on, shapes their identity. We need men who are going to rise to the challenge to be husbands, firstly men of God, husbands and fathers, husbands who love their wives, fathers who shape their kids' identity. When I see a healthy, uh, um, confident kid, I'm going, I'm pretty sure there's a good dad. I'm pretty sure there's a good dad behind that kid. Not often wrong. It's just true. Just as a fact. So gentlemen, I hope you've been challenged. I hope you've been encouraged. Ladies, does that helpful too? 
Hope you weren't bored, Lynchon. Were you okay? Help you understand uh, Remit a bit better? Good. Um, go and have a wonderful Father's Day. So, um, 